We are in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23 today, and we're looking at a prayer. And I love the prayers in the Bible. They, they instruct me how to pray for my loved ones. They instruct me how to pray for the church. And, uh, and I have to tell you that I have wrestled at times knowing how to pray. How do I pray for people? The more that I've gotten to know people in the church, the more that I've become friends with people, the more that I see what people are struggling with, a lot of my prayers are like, God, fix it. Make the pain go away. Keep them from suffering. Solve this problem. And oftentimes it's a very specific problem medically, and, and we watch God work, and, and I pray, but I recognize that God knows more, and he's doing things that we can't see. I, I would use as an illustration uh, the disciples who prayed for Jesus the night before he died. So Jesus said, watch and pray to his friends, and they fell asleep but during their prayer meeting. It was all night long, and they were discouraged. But the reality, how would you have prayed if you didn't know how this was going to end that night in the garden? I would have prayed, no pain, please, Father. Protect Jesus. There's threats um, amidst the people that he's going to be put to death. I'm praying, God, that he doesn't die. How did they pray? How would you have prayed? What would you ask God to do the night before Jesus died for Jesus if you didn't know the end of the story? Sometimes that's how I feel when I pray that I don't know what God knows. I can't see what God sees. I feel like I'm a little kid in the back seat on one of these trips. My parents used to drive us to the first grandma in Culbertson, Montana, and then to the second grandparents in, uh, in Culbertson, in, uh, sorry, up in Hagen, Saskatchewan. It was a long trip. And the kids in the back seat had lots of advice for where we should be driving and what we should be doing. We didn't get to Rockford before the advice started. Ah, Daddy, I got to go potty. I'm hungry. I want to play. And my dad would make decisions. He would listen to us, giving advice from the back seat. But we always got to our destination. Some advice he had to not respond to. I want to go back home. <laughs> no, no, no. We're in Wisconsin. We're on our way. He didn't listen to every bit of advice. And I think sometimes that's how we pray, that God wants us to tell our concerns, wants to give him advice from the back seat, but we have to recognize we're the little kids in this story. We don't know how to get there, but God's the one who's going to get us home. There are prayers in Scripture that we can pray with utter confidence, and I'm going to argue before the end of the sermon that we should pray all of our concerns with confidence. All of our concerns with confidence that we have a Father who loves us and wants to hear our concerns. Whatever they are. Lord, I'm running late and the light's red. Would you turn it green? Is that too little to bother Jesus with? I think not. I think whatever our anxieties are and our concerns are, we can cast them on the Lord. But we should recognize that when we come to prayer, we have a God who is working powerfully on our behalf to bring about his good purposes. And that might require him to say no and to give us something that we didn't want. Let's look at the passage in Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might." that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. 
And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I have titled this sermon, A Prayer for the Bridge Church, because this is what I pray for us. This and other prayers that I find in Scripture, I pray with the confidence knowing that when I'm praying this, I am completely in line with the Father's will, and he wants to say yes to this. He will say yes to this when we pray it. There are prayers that we know this is what God wants, and then there are other prayers we don't know what God wants. And it gives me great confidence as we look at this prayer, we looked at the one in Colossians before, that prayer that starts out the book of Colossians. We have another prayer coming in chapter 3 of Ephesians. I want you to know that when I was a young dad, I prayed these prayers over my kids. I wondered, how, what do I really want for my children? If I could get something, if, I, if God would say yes, and what do I want him to do? What I want him to do is answer these prayers that are found in Scripture that completely align with what God's doing for us. Now, I also prayed that that kid would stop picking on them in junior high. And I also prayed that they would get a good grade on their tests. And I also prayed that they'd be kept safe and that they would find a mate and that they would love the Lord. And There were so many things that I prayed over them, but you could find me as a young dad going into the room and when they're asleep and praying over them, these prayers. And I knew it was the will of the Father that I asked him of this. The prayer starts in verse 15 with thanksgiving. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith and in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. For this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Paul begins saying, I'm thankful. He's writing from prison. And he has heard about the faith that is in Ephesus and in the, the churches that are around Ephesus. And he's considering that faith and love that is flourishing. And he's so thankful. He's thankful to God. That's how he starts his prayer. I want you to know that when I think of you, I'm thankful. Well, I want you to know that when I think of the Bridge Church, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for all of you. I'm thankful for how you love each other. I'm thankful for the grace and the love and the faith that grows here and how we can grow together as a family. Is it perfect? No such thing this side of heaven. It's not going to be perfect. But I want you to know that as a pastor, I consider myself so blessed. I had a friend who told me that, you know, he's preaching at his church and he said, Todd, I don't think I have a friend in the church. And I didn't even know how to respond because I think you're all my friends. I think this is a place of friendship and love and fellowship, and I'm so thankful that we are growing in faith of, with, of Christ together as we study his word, and I'm so thankful that we can love each other and care for each other. And it wounds me when somebody moves to Tennessee. <laughs> Not just because of the worship leader, but because we'll miss you, your family, right? And Paul begins thanking God for this love that's in the saints and for this faith that's growing, and he doesn't cease to give thanks. Remembering you in my prayers, it is wise for us to begin with gratitude when we pray. It is wise for us to remember what we're thankful for. We may come with a laundry list of things that we're concerned about, and usually we should and do. God, these are the things that I'm worried about. These are the things I'm concerned about. These are the things that cause me anxiety, and he's encouraged me to cast my anxious thoughts on him. But I want to begin with all that I'm thankful for, so much that I'm thankful for. I am thankful for faith. I am thankful for love. I am thankful that it's flourishing, and I'm asking God for it to flourish more. Notice who he's thankful to. I'm not saying thank you to each of you, right now, that you were part of the church and that you chose to believe. And I think there's room for that gratitude, but ultimately who we're thanking is God is the one who has called us to be a family. God is the one who has called us together. 
God is the one who has encouraged us, and we thank God for each other. When I begin thanks for my children and thanks for my wife and thanks for the people they've married and thank you for my grandchildren and thank you for the church that's here, I thank God. I think God is the one who has provided. God is the one who has given us what we have. When I look at what he's given us in the church, I think God is the one who's caused that. I do not think that some of our parts are going to create a great church. I think we thank God for the church we have and that faith is flourishing in. Notice who we're thanking. And notice, as I'm saying it this time, I'm not just thanking Nathan and Rachel for being part of our church. I'm thanking God for giving Nathan and Rachel to us for a season. And the kids, every one of them. God is the one who has done this, and we begin our prayer with thanksgiving. In verse 17, he turns to his prayer, what he's praying for this this group of churches that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. He prays for knowledge. He prays for you to understand something. What is he wanting those churches to understand? What is he wanting them to know? But he even goes beyond that and talks about what kind of knowledge it is. And in the only place in the scriptures where this is described this way. Verse 18, having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know. And then he gives us three things he wants us to know. But the eyes of your heart, it's a knowledge that goes not just to the, not the mind where you can get the right answer on the test. It gets to your heart and the core of who you are. It's, 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 it's basically asking for you to understand in a way that affects your whole being, your emotions, your decision-making, your perspectives. You cannot see the world without understanding this about God. You cannot see other people without understanding this about God. He's praying that the the body, the church, will understand with their hearts, would have their eyes open and be able to see this knowledge. And remember what this follows. We've just looked at our identity in Christ. In Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 14. In those passages, we saw that we were adopted, that we were chosen, we were predestined, we were given the Holy Spirit as a down payment, that we have this community that is a called community, chosen community, and we realize that in the back seat of the car, basically, that we were picked to be in the back seat on this trip with God the church. And he's saying, I want you to get it. And maybe as I'm preaching this, you don't understand what I'm saying, but there are people that know in their mind that they're loved, but they don't believe it in their hearts. There are people that know that they have value, but don't believe it. There are people that know that some of the things that people said about them when they were young are not true, but they still have something in their heart that's telling them something else. And Paul is saying, I want you to get this. I want you to understand who you are, and I'm asking the God the Lord, the, the Lord of Je- and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he would give you a spirit of wisdom. He's asking the Holy Spirit to do that. This picture is taken from Isaiah 11, Verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. In Isaiah eleven two, 2, he's talking about the Messiah and he's talking about the spirit doing this work in the, in the, in the Messiah. And it's what Jesus promises in John 14, 26 But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things I have said. And in John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit is given to us 
to open the eyes of our hearts, to help us understand, to help us see who we are in Christ and what Christ is doing. And He is our advocate. He is our helper. He is this promissory note, but now there's a prayer that the Spirit would come alive in us and help us to hear Him, to be taught by Him, to be instructed by Him. Now picture this in the middle of the difficulty that you're praying for. And I have so many that I'm praying for you all. Serious difficulties. Housing, medical, age, financial. Difficulties. And the prayer is is that the Spirit of God would open your heart and open your eyes and cause you to see Can you see who you are in Christ? Can you live your life understanding that you are a chosen child of God and He is on a mission delivering you home? And we're just in the back seat with our legs not reaching the the floor and kicking our legs. But I want God to do what I want Him to do. I want to turn around and head back to Illinois. No, no. You really don't want that. You want God to be God. The prayer is that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding and revelation and knowledge would cause the eyes of our heart to be enlightened. And then he says that three things specifically we would know. And notice in here, we don't necessarily know we're going to move to, and we don't necessarily know how the money is going to be provided, and we don't necessarily know how this is going to work out medically. That's not promised here. It's not even prayed for here. In verse 18, the knowledge of what is the hope to which you, he has called you. He wants the eyes of your heart to be opened so that you would understand what is the hope to which he has called you. He wants you to understand what God is accomplishing. He is bringing you in under the, the lordship of Jesus Christ By the power and the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, he is changing you to be more like Christ. He is preparing you for the day when you'll be home and stand before him in glory. You're here presenting a story to others and telling and testifying so that more can come. We are part of this hopeful expectation that Jesus Christ has changed our story and our destination, and now we are the adopted children of God, and we are in process. And it is my conviction that God is more concerned with your character than your comfort. Did you hear that? I'm sorry about that. I really am, because I pray for your comfort. But I'm just a little kid in the seat next to you. prayer is that you would understand the hope of the calling and how exciting that we have hope. Do you know how powerful hope is? No matter how bleak it is, no matter how dark it is, no matter how difficult it is, we have an eternal hope that will not be diminished, and will not be put away. We will always have reason for hope in Christ. First is that we would understand what is the hope to which he has called us. The second is what are the riches of his and glorious inheritance in the saints. This is an interesting phrase. I want you to actually focus on this for a minute. He wants, he's praying that we would understand, and I prayed for my children and for you all, that you would understand what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Well, we read earlier in in Ephesians already about the riches of his gift that he has for us. But if you look at the wording here, it's actually not our inheritance. We are the inheritance. This is the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. We are part of God's glorious inheritance. And this is part of that 
true thing. Am I, am I God's or is God mine? And the truth is it's both true. He is my God and I am his. And in this point, he's actually wanting you to understand that you are the Lord's. He has you. you are, your identity is wrapped up in being his inheritance. And that's surprising to me. Many times in my life I have thought he got a bum deal with me being his inheritance. He gave up his life on the cross, and the, the result, his reward, is us. And yet, God is the one who defines value. As I was thinking about this in preparation for the sermon, I remember that day when I uh, was in Orlando at Disney World, Warmans, Barbers, and Burgies, and all the kids. And we are in Epcot Center. And the girls go to do something and leave the kids with us. And there is a constant count. How many kids do you have? How many kids do you have? How many kids do you have, right? I lost one. Jeannie leaves me responsible for 25 minutes, and Rachel is not there when she comes back. We are in a sea of people, and Rachel is gone. Jeannie looks at me in terror. What happened to Rachel? And I look her dumbfounded. I have no idea. I told her to stay. She was maybe three years old. I don't know if Jeannie is in the room, if you can tell me how old she was when I let her wander through Epcot Center. But all of a sudden, there became this mass hunt. Do you know how many kids were in Epcot that day? I don't. But I know which one was mine. Do you know how much I pursued her? I pursued her like it mattered. You are the Lord's. And he loves you. And he wants the eyes of your heart to understand what I wanted Rachel to understand when we found her walking down the middle of an aisle doing this. She had gone up to these doors that open automatically and off she went. And walking unconcerned. Jeannie headed for the doors to make sure that somebody hadn't abducted her and walked out of the park with her. And how did I respond when I found her? You are the Lord's inheritance. He's going to get you home. He's not dispassionate about your struggles and your difficulties. He's doing something you can't see. Verse in uh, finally, in verse 19, he says the fir- third thing he's praying for, he's prayed for hope, he's prayed for the riches of the glorious inheritance of the saints. And in verse 19, pray that, that you have a knowledge of what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Do you have any idea how God's power is at work in you and what he's accomplishing? In order for us to understand it, listen to the words that are used in Scripture. I pray that you would have the eyes of your heart open so that you would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. What's his point? How much does he want you to understand that God is already presently powerfully working in your life to bring about his good purposes for you with that incredible love with which he pursued you. He wants the eyes of your heart opened to understand what God's doing. Have you ever been tempted when you're praying to think of God as apathetic about your pain? Have you ever been tempted to think maybe God's not listening? And I would argue you don't know God. You haven't thought. You need the eyes of your heart opened to understand that his immeasurably great power is for you, for us, the church. This prayer that we can pray with the confidence of knowing that it is within the will of God when we pray it for each other begins with thanksgiving. It's a prayer for knowledge. And finally, It's a prayer of abundant power. In verses 20 through 23, we see this last phrase, this last 
opening of our eyes to understand this power, he now begins to describe that power, that he has enacted on our behalf. In verse 20, speaking of this great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He wants us to see the power that's at work for us and in us and look at the cross to do it. Look at what God accomplished in the cross. And now let me take you back to the prayer of the disciples the night before Jesus dies. And what are they praying? What would we have been praying? We would have been praying that God would take away the pain, that God would save his life, that God would cause the enemies to fail. And as they watched the next 24 hours unfold, they probably were tempted to think, where is God? And now that very story is what God is using to tell us how much he is powerfully working for us. What they couldn't see, what they couldn't see before Jesus was raised from the dead is that God the Father was powerfully at work in all of it. In every moment. And he was working because he loved Peter and he loved James and he loved John. And he was not going to stop working because he loved you and he loved me. And that powerful working was for us. And yeah, we're little kids in the back seat and saying, God, not that. Anything but that. And God says, well, that's exactly what's going to be required. And you'll understand one. This isn't a prayer that we are going to understand what God's doing. This is a prayer that we are going to understand that God's love and power and the hope that we have because of it is beyond what we could have imagined. Have the eyes of your heart been enlightened by the Holy Spirit to see who you are and what he's doing? This power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. What does that mean, seated at the right hand? First, he begins with this resurrection and then seating and then subjecting everything to him and he gave him to be head. In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, it talks about the bodily resurrection of Christ. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. When Christ was raised from the dead, he overcame sin and death for us. It wasn't just that he raised him from the dead. He raised him from the dead for us. This is the power of God working, overcoming sin and death for us. Seated him at the right hand. In Psalms 110, verse 1, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament It says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus was raised and seated at the right hand in the heavenly places. What does that mean for us? It means that Jesus now reigns over all. And we're going to see as the passage goes on that that means he reigns over the powers and the principalities. And it means that our advocate, the one who loves us, the one who sympathized with us, the one who died for us is powerful enough in a position to actually influence our lives for good and our hope is secure. So when we pray, God, please make it so that my kids aren't hurt when they leave the house. Please, as we go into this operation, give wisdom to the doctors and let this turn out right. How are we to think about that? Well, in part, we are to think that God is bigger than us and has an answer for us that is within his keeping, and he will accomplish his good purposes in us. That's in part. I don't want you to stop praying. I'm actually going to encourage you to pray every prayer you have. Just remember you're a little kid in the back seat. Seated at the right hand of the Father. He's also subjected everything to him. And in Psalms 8, 16, sorry, in 8, 6, it says, 
You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under his feet. The picture is that Jesus reigns and there is a new kingdom where he reigns where all things are going to turn to good and that kingdom is going to grow into a kingdom one day when he reigns completely and all things are brought under subjection to him and it will be good again. Everything will be good. This is his view. This is what he's accomplishing and he's written us into the story and even today as we pray that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven and we pray that his will would be done in our lives that we're praying that we would align ourselves with this kingdom work that Jesus is doing in this world where things are brought under his reign and things are redeemed and they're good again. We're not just asking for our way, we're asking that God will get us to the destination. We're old enough to understand that the Father is trying to get us to Culbertson and then to Hagen. There's a purpose behind this trip. And finally, this passage ends. He put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus is given headship over the church, which is his body, the fullness who fills all in all. Jesus is our head. Jesus is the one that is our provider, is our protector, is the one that we can cry out to, is our advocate. He is the one who leads the church. And I'm talking about the churches everywhere. All the individual churches that meet and the, and the, the whole church, that we are under the headship of Jesus Christ and to the degree that we submit to Jesus Christ, the church flourishes. It's his intention to bless us, to fill us, to use us, and to accomplish his good purposes in the church. What a privilege to be part of the church. What a privilege to be part of the church with you. I am so thankful that this is God's plan, and I am thankful to Jesus Christ that he is our head, and he is the one who is causing the fullness of him who fills all in all. And, and that phrase is an interesting phrase. It could mean that Jesus is the one who's filling all in all through the church, or Jesus is filling all in all with, you know, how is this? And I think it's Jesus who's the, the subject matter, who's filling all things and making all things good. But we in the church, we part of his body, get to be part of that. We get to tell the stories out in the world and we get to share of his glory and our mouths can be used for filling the all in all and our actions can be used for the filling all in all. And we can pass on to each other this great gift, this great hope that we have, this faith that we have in Jesus Christ. This prayer wasn't, in, wasn't written before the disciples went to pray for Jesus. It was written before I started praying for my kids. I used to take pictures of junior hires when I did junior high ministry, and I would write these prayers on the back of them and I would, because I wanted to learn their names, but I'm praying these prayers for them. Not just that they won't get bullied in junior high and that they'll... I wanted them, their eyes of their heart to be opened so they would understand this faith. Don't you want that for each other? So how do we pray? I mean, it, I have had my doubts about how to pray. I have been with people and not known what the will of the Father is. And sometimes I'll pray something and then I'm muttering under my breath, God, please heal them. Please save them. Please solve this. And then under my breath, I mutter, if it's your will, I know I'm not driving the car. I know you have plans that are not my plans. And I have grown in my faith to believe this. And I'm still in process, and my prayer life is going to change as I get older, I'm sure. I'll tell you something about my dad driving the car to Culbertson and Hagen. He cared about what we thought. He pulled over 
when we had concerns. The point of the trip was us. That's why he was making the trip. He wasn't making the trip just to get to the destination. He was making the trip because he loved us. Do you not know that this trip that we're on with God, how much God loves you? May the eyes of your heart be opened. You have someone who's driving the car that we can trust who's going to bring us home. He's not going to give us everything we want, but his desire is to give us the desires of his heart, and he wrote a story where he wants us to pray and cast all of our concerns upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. This is not, we're just going to pray the prayers of the Bible for each other and not be concerned. No, we're the little kids, right? And God cares deeply about what we care about. Pray. Pray knowing he's not going to turn back to Illinois. I get that. You don't have to keep reminding him. Can you imagine me in a conversation with my dad? Dad, I have to go to the bathroom. You know, I need you to drive back to the house so that I can go to the bathroom at home because that's where I'm most comfortable. No, but I can give you this because I love you. And we did not arrive. But you know, when my, when my dad pulled over, my mom would always pack a lunch. There was no fast food when I was a kid. And we didn't get fast food. McDonald's might have been started, but that's not what we did. She did wax paper and sandwiches, and we would pull over. And my dad would climb the tallest tree at the rest stop that he could find. He'd hang a swing. What does that have to do with the destination? Nothing. But some of my fondest memories are on that swing and watching my dad shimmy up these tall trees. And my mom saying, oh, Phil, <laughs> freaking out. <laughs> that has nothing to do with prayer, I just threw that in. <laughs> do you have any idea how much God loves you? Do you have any idea his power that he's working for you to get you to the destination he has already chosen for you? I wrote this out in a prayer, which I'd like to pray over us now as we close. Father, thank you for our church. Thank you for each person you have called and gathered here. Thank you for the faith in Christ that is growing in us, and thank you for the love of Christ that you've given us to share with each other. Father, you are the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of glory, and I pray that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Christ. I pray that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened and that we would know what is the hope to which you have called us, what are the riches of his and glorious inheritance in the church, and what is the immeasurable greatness of your power towards us who believe. In Jesus' name, amen.